Well, hey, everybody, man, we're so glad to see you today. I want to welcome you to our fiscal locations. I also want to welcome you, to those of you that are watching on television every week with us. You've been so kind in your comments. You've been so encouraging, and uh, I, I love that. So if you want to continue to reach out to me in some way, you'll see my email address there. It's the best way to get me, and I would love for you to submit questions or whatever you might have. And then we have so many, hundreds and hundreds of you that watch us online every week, and I would encourage you to uh, engage in the chat and engage with our online pastor, and thanks for just staying connected with us during this crazy, uncertain time that we live in. So uh, last week, we finished up the bucket list, which is like my all-time favorite series we've ever done at Highlands, probably. Uh, I love to dream, and I've challenged you to dream great dreams for God, and it seemed like that touched a nerve. And uh, at the end of that message last week, you may remember if you were watching or here, that I said, uh, you know, the goal that God's laid hold of me for is to push you out into the deep end. You know, we as Christians, we want to stay in the shallow end and really what God wants, he wants us to grow up, right? Just like we want our kids to grow up. So my job is to sort of challenge you from time to time and get you out of swimming in the shallow end and sort of move you out into the deep. Now, it's scary to go there. I get that. You know, it's hard to learn how to swim. You might drown. And there's lots of reasons why you don't want to go out into the deep. But when you look at the principles that Jesus laid forth in his word, uh, he wants us to move into maturity. He wants us to grow up. So today, I'm starting a series called Becoming the Bridge. And my hope through this series is it will challenge you. May it even raise some tension in your life, because sometimes tension can be good. And I pray that God's Holy Spirit might use these series of messages to sort of move you out from the shallow end to think about how you can become a bridge to somebody God's placed in your life, becoming a bridge. Now, how I'm going to do this series is I want to kick it off today, and we have incredible teaching team here at Highlands, as you well know. And some of our pastors are doing incredible things in their particular locations, their community, on becoming a bridge to different areas and different groups within that area. And so Pastor Mark's going to help me out, and Pastor Robbie's going to help me out, Pastor Craig. And, and I think all of these folks will challenge you to really grow in your Christian life, to think about some things we just never really think about often and uh, to see how we can make our communities and our world a better place. So today, uh, let's delve in to becoming a bridge. And what I want to deal with you about, and I think all these guys will do the same thing, is I want to talk to you about four things today that are personal to me. Uh, and everything I want to share with you, uh, I'm going to share with you that God sort of challenged me to become a bridge in all four of these areas. They're on my heart. They continue to be on my heart. And uh, I just want us to do that. Now, if you've been in Highlands very long, uh, you know, I'm a pretty simple person. All right. Uh, I'm a pretty simple guy. So let's go back in the beginning as we launch this series. And let's just talk about a little bit of the purpose of a bridge, the purpose of a bridge. Before we can become a bridge, uh, we've got to understand the purpose behind that, right? So there are so many different kinds of bridges in our world today. You know, uh, some are wooden and uh, some are made out of stone. Uh, the ones that most of us travel over on the interstates are made out of lots of steel and tons of concrete, right? Uh, some bridges are very small. When I was in Tanzania back in 1990, I remember crossing a bridge and that thing was small, but uh, I felt like it was going to cave in at any minute. You know, I mean, it, it was wobbly and I'm a big guy and I'm thinking I'm going to go down and it was probably a 50 foot drop. And I'm thinking, I don't want to go across that bridge. And then I remember the first time uh, I had it when I was a church planner and I had this job going up to coal mines to do hydraulic work. And I would pick up these hydraulic jacks in Morgantown, West Virginia. And I remember crossing the New River Gorge Bridge on that trip to Morgantown. Now, I don't know if you've ever seen that bridge or been there, but that took my breath. I mean, you can't hardly see the bottom when you look over that bridge. And I thought, 
This thing is absolutely amazing. Matter of fact, they have National Bridge Day there. And if you've never been, I would just encourage you to go. They have crazy people that go once a year and jump off that bridge. It's so high that they can jump off that bridge with a parachute and still have time to pull the parachute and land safely in the new river. Now, I'm not going to do that, but it's fun watching people do it. It's pretty amazing. And that bridge is just incredible. You know, when you think about the planning and the engineering and the expense and the effort that it takes to make these bridges like the New River Gorge Bridge, it's mind-boggling, right? I mean, it's just mind-boggling. And yet, these things were constructed. They were actually built. And why were they built? Well, the purpose of a bridge is it spans a chasm. And it helps people go from point A to point B. So when you look at bridges in your community, the leaders of that community, the builders of those bridges decided that we need to span this chasm in this particular area and it will make our community better. It allows for people on this side to get to that side. And these builders took the engineering plans and they were motivated to build it because they saw the need, right? I mean, they saw the need. So with that in mind, let's apply that same principle to our ministry here at Highlands. In our community, in our region, and in our world, there are people all around us who are on the other side of the chasm, right? We, we know who these people are. And there is a gap between us and them. And we even understand this, right? I mean, we understand there is a gap between who I am and often the person on the other side of the bridge. We understand that. And there is a need for a bridge in order to help them cross over. We're bridge builders here. You know, this is not only a principle that Jesus taught us, and we'll talk about this to the end of the message, he became a bridge for us, but this is a biblical principle throughout the scripture. Uh, let's look at 1 Corinthians. I want to look at chapter 9, and I want to look at some things that Paul said in his life. Remember, Paul was a citizen of Rome, and that was the greatest empire in the world. And citizenship in Rome had its privileges, right? I mean, they were free. They could do anything they wanted to do. But as you know, Paul became a believer in Jesus, and God got a hold of Paul's heart. And when that happened, Paul began to yield his privileges of being a Roman citizen so other people could come to know Christ. Now, let's look at this from 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Look with me in verse 19 at what Paul says. He says, Even though I am a free man with no master... I have become a slave to all people to bring many to Christ. When I was with the Jews, I lived like a Jew to bring Jews to Christ. When I was with those who follow the Jewish law, I too lived under that law, even though I am not subject to the law. I did this so I could bring to Christ those who were under the law. So what's Paul saying? You know, the Jewish people, they had all these kosher laws. I mean, they, were, they had tons of them, right? And uh, they would only eat certain things on certain days. Well, Paul, he didn't have to give himself to those kosher laws. But because he had a heart for Jewish people to understand who Jesus truly was, he decided, I'm going to abide by those kosher laws. I'm going to eat what you eat. I'm going to become like you so that I can earn the right to tell you about Jesus. And Paul had an amazing ministry among the Jews. He goes on in verse 21. When I'm with the Gentiles, now that's us in case you didn't know, because we're not Jewish people. Most of us aren't Jewish. And if you are Jewish, you know that. So the rest of us are Gentiles. And he says, when I'm among the Gentiles who do not follow the Jewish law, but we eat anything all the time, right? Probably into our good. I too live apart from that law so I can bring them to Christ. But I do not ignore the law of God. And Paul says, I obey the greater law, the law of Christ. And then he says, not only when I'm among the Jews and when I'm with the Gentiles, I build a bridge to them. He says, when I'm with those who are weak, I share their weaknesses. For I want to bring the weak to Christ. Yes, I try to find common ground. And I love that phrase. Common ground is Paul is becoming the bridge, right? And that's what common ground is. I try to find common ground with everyone doing everything I can 
to save some. I do everything to spread the good news and to share his blessings. So I read that about Paul, that particular passage of Scripture. And what is amazing to me is that Paul became a bridge to so many people who were not like him, right? And God used him. And I begin to think, you know, if Paul became a bridge, and this, this occurred to me years and years ago, if Paul became a bridge to the Jews and to the Gentiles and to the weak and to many others when you read his writings, who am I, God, to become a bridge to? So again, I want to share four areas that are real personal with me. I want to challenge you to think about maybe God would have you to be a part of becoming a bridge to one of these areas that I speak about today. But these are four that really have a place in my heart that I've tried to build a bridge to, and I want them to build a bridge to me. Here's the first one. We need to build a bridge to foster children. Foster children need a bridge. I'm convinced that God has uniquely gifted the church to care for the needs of hurting children. You know, Jesus lets us know right out of the gate, he loves kids, right? I mean, Jesus loves children. And anytime Jesus was teaching, wherever he was, who, who just embraced him? Kids. That tells me a lot about the personality of Jesus, right? I mean, he wasn't some stuck-up guy. He was down on their level playing with kids. Kids love Jesus. Jesus loved kids. We cannot hide our heads in the sand and dismiss the responsibility that God has given to us, the church. Really, I consider an opportunity that we have to be a part for over 5,000 children in just Virginia alone. I mean, think about this, guys. And I understand, I've heard the arguments all the time. I understand your, your first comeback is, you know, I, I get it. Not all people are equipped to foster. Uh, not all folks want to go down the adoption route, provide a forever home. But this is what I would tell you. If you're a child of God, we are all called to engage with vulnerable children one way or another. And there are many folks sitting in our churches and wondering, what does God have for me? This is one way for you to get involved in his work. And this breaks my heart. Virginia, and you can check this out. There's an organization that we love here at Highlands it's called virginiakidsbelong.org. You can go to their website. And right now they have 5,200 children in the foster care system in Virginia. And that, that blows my mind. And of these children, on any given day, 850 are legally free for adoption. They're just waiting for their forever family. The rest of these kids, the vast majority, over 4,000 of these children, are desiring a loving, safe, supportive foster family to care for them while their moms and dads get their lives back together. And there are lots of times very genuine reasons why a family has to give up care for their kids for a certain time. Mom and dad have to get it together, and, and so they need foster families. Maybe that's you. Maybe you could be a foster family. What are some practical steps? Well, if you want to be a foster family, you got to get trained because we want kids to have safe foster families, right? And then you might say, well, I could never do that. That's not for me. I'm too old or whatever. Well, right now at Highlands, we have over 70 families that have already trained, and many of them have been placed with foster children. Find one of those families and take a meal to them. I know when Brenda and I were foster, uh, we were foster parents for several kids, and, and we would have loved for somebody to have come over. You got to get trained for this too, because we want to protect the kids. And just said, hey, we want to care for the foster kids tonight. You and Brenda go out and have dinner. That never happened. And uh, we all know that those of us who are fostering kids, we need a support group around us. So you could just practically help in some very simple ways, provide a meal or provide a night out or whatever it might be. But would you build a bridge to these 5,200 foster children in Virginia? I don't know what that is for you, but I trust the Holy Spirit will speak to you. Here's a second thing that I think we need to build a bridge to. Hurting Christians need a bridge. Obviously, I'm a pastor, so this is near and dear to my heart, and I find Christians that know Jesus Christ, but yet they're hurting all over the place. Now, I go back to what Jesus told us in John chapter 15, verse 12, and Jesus said this, this is my commandment, that you love one another as I've loved you. 
So there are so many reasons that Christians are hurting today. Uh, you know, as a believer, it's easy to get disconnected from a local church, and we know when that happens, if you're a child of God today, and you know Jesus, and yet you're not involved in a local church family, you know what the Bible says? You're spiritually homeless. And we know what physical homeless looks like, right? It's awful. And if you're spiritually homeless, that's awful too. So we want to build a bridge to you. I know so many of you have been hurt in a church setting and you've just said, oh my goodness, I trusted these folks. And I went and I'm thinking, the church of all places. And yet you were hurt in a deep way. And so you quit. But I would say you can't quit. You need the local church. Keep going, keep visiting, keep trying until you find a church home that can become your spiritual family. Now, obviously there are no perfect churches out there. I, I love our church. I would love for our church to be your home. Matter of fact, we call Highlands home. But you know what? Highlands isn't a perfect church. Uh, it's our mission that we're imperfect people, but we're willing to embrace you, imperfect people. And we believe that God will do radical things in our life when we all experience life with Jesus. Some of you are disconnected and some of you are hurting because you moved to our area and you've just been lax on finding another church. Well, check us out or check someplace out. You need a spiritual family. And then sometimes I think you have a knowledge of Jesus Christ and maybe, you know, you've stepped across the line and you've given your life to Jesus Christ, but you've just never been taught the importance of being part of a local church in your life. Regardless of the reason, you're disconnected and you need a bridge to cross over. I love what the author of Hebrews says in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25. He says this, he says, let us not neglect our meeting together. Now it looks different today, doesn't it? I know we're in a pandemic and I would love for be able to invite you to come to a physical location and hug you and tell you, man, I'm so glad you're here and that kind of stuff. But we can't do that right now. Uh, we're, we want to be safe and all that stuff. But the church is a place where you find community. And you know, the neat thing is, We've been able to do that digitally as well. So in our online community, you can actually develop community and connection online, right from your home. And if you'd give us a chance to build a bridge to you, man, that would be awesome. Just let our online pastor know you want to do that. But we can't neglect meeting together. You know, we live in a real world. It's in the fantasy land. And in the real world, people get hurt. Now, whether it's intentional or not, I mean, folks get hurt. And sometimes that hurt keeps us from moving forward. And when you have hurt, it's a chasm that needs to be crossed. So many hurting people today need a bridge to help them get over it and get on with their life in service to Christ. So let me just ask you here at Highlands, would you become a bridge to hurting Christians? I guarantee you know some who are disconnected. Uh, we ask you to invite and, and step up a little bit and love and, and uh, form friendships. So uh, would you do that? Would you become a bridge to a hurting Christian? Here's one that I want to challenge you with. Again, we're a blended family. Almost all of you know that. We adopted two kids from Ethiopia 10 years ago, and they are just incredible kids. But when we did that, we became aware long before what we're seeing on TV, there is some racial tension in our area and in our community and in our world. So this third group, the racial divide needs a bridge. The racial divide needs a bridge. Now, again, this is, this is personal to me. I want, I've got five kids and I want all my kids to have the same opportunity. Uh, I want them to be treated fairly. Uh, I think every parent wants that. And I think the first thing we have to do as an individual is we have to answer this question. Is there still a race problem? Because you know what I learned? So many of us think, you know what? I don't think there's any race problem today. I mean, that was an injustice. Uh, you know, we, we solved that years and years ago. And this is what I would say. I think everybody would say we've made some astounding progress. I mean, my goodness, thank the Lord that we've made progress. We pushed the bar. We've made some great progress. But then when you see things in our culture in 2020, and we see these horrific things like the death of Ahmaud Aubrey and this death of George Floyd, and it brings us back to the reality. There's still some, yeah, we got a long way to go, right? I and mean, we have a long way to go. 
And I think if you can look at that and watch that, because I think every person in America has seen this now, and it doesn't do something to your heart, it doesn't break your heart in some way that this stuff is still happening in our culture in 2020, on our watch, then I would just ask you to check your heart. I've always respected Billy Graham. He's with the Lord now, but six years ago, Billy Graham made a statement right toward the end of his public ministry. I want to read that statement to you. Graham said this, he said, racial, racial and ethnic hostility is the foremost social problem facing our world today. From the systemic horror of ethnic cleansing in Bosnia to the random violence ravaging our inner cities, our world seems caught up in a tidal wave of racial and ethnic tension. This hostility threatens the very foundations of our modern society. Now, six years ago, he called racial tension a tidal wave. If he was living today, we would give it a new name. We would call it a tsunami, right? I mean, it's a tsunami. And unfortunately, the Christian church seems inadequate in many ways to rouse ourselves from our apathy and actually face these deep-rooted global national social problems. There's a huge disparity between the vision that God has for us and our current social reality. And Christians, it, it just, we seem powerless to even begin to bridge the gap. I mean, we're almost exhausted when we look at it. And we just think, we're going to let somebody else take care of it. But I want to tell you something, guys. We have to respond to this. We must respond. What should be the church's response as we wade in to this racial divide? It's being tearing our communities apart with the prejudice and hatred and fear. Well, our response as a church, should we choose to accept it, is to become a bridge to these dividing walls of hostility that are tearing our world apart. Now, we face a mission that in so many ways just seems impossible. But as Christians, we're called to work together to make this world a better place. We're called to represent the kingdom of God on earth. We're called to so much more than tolerance, and definitely we're called to so much more than political correctness. We are called to reconcile all people to Jesus Christ. Now, when that calling is placed on your heart as a believer, does that motivate you? Does that stir you at all? Or does it just sound like wishful thinking? And we look around today, and no wonder so many people believe that racial reconciliation is just a pipe dream, you know, based on some reality. But I would say, is it? Is it truly just a pipe dream that is never going to be solved? Personally, and this is just my personal belief, I believe God's raising up a generation that's going to bring about spiritual healing and racial reconciliation once for all. I really believe they're going to get it right. And why is that? Because today's young people have grown up in a multicultural, a multi-ethnic world, and so many of them... I look at the young people on our staff and young people that come to Highlands. These guys, these men and women, they are incredible young people. I mean, they're awesome. And they, they just want a different path. You know, they've seen shattered relationships and family brokenness and racial and ethnic hatred. They've watched wars and terrorism. And they say, dude, I want something different. I want a path of reconciliation. I want mutual respect and understanding. I want a path that leads to connection. Now, obviously, I'm not talking about those that are turning to violence or looting. That's anarchy. That's not what we're embracing at all. But there is a longing that lies deep within the next generation. And you know what? I believe God's going to bless their efforts. Now, I, you know, I, I say this to the young generation, but honestly, no matter what age you are, we all have a part to play, and God is moving to equip his people and I believe he wants us to use spiritual weapons, not, you know, man-made weapons. And that he will give us the divine power to bring down and demolish the walls of racism and hatred and oppression and injustice and fear. At the root of racism, it's a spiritual problem. It's a spiritual problem. And if you are a racist, you have a spiritual problem. And that is in stark contrast of what Jesus Christ has called us to be. Paul reminds us in Ephesians chapter 6, he says, our battle is not against flesh and blood, 
It's against rulers and authorities and powers and spiritual forces of evil and heavenly realms. In other words, our weapons are not weapons of this world. Now, obviously, there are no quick fixes or we would have fixed this years ago. And the journey could be costly. But I want to challenge you to recognize that we are living in an unprecedented time in history. I'm excited about it. I think God is moving and something new and exciting and powerful is happening in our world. And instead of relying on our own strength and our own ingenuity, we're called to partner with God. We're to join him in where he's working and do what he's doing. And I believe that a wave of God's spirit is coming, a mighty outpouring of the presence of God. It's just scriptural as well. Racial and ethnic reconciliation will be a distinguishing mark, maybe the distinguishing mark of this next outpouring of God's spirit. And as we all repent of our sins and renounce our idolatries that have divided us and break patterns that have bound us, you know what God will do? God will be delighted to bring a great revival to his people and a great advance to his gospel. Here's the question. Will you become the bridge in this work of racial reconciliation of God's spirit in our day? You know, at Highlands, the reason I love our church so much, we minister to hope of the gospel of Jesus Christ to all people. You know what? We proclaim healing to every person, all people of every ethnicity. We've been doing this for years of every nationality who long to experience God's powerful ministry of reconciliation among every nation on this earth. We're on the front lines to fulfill the Great Commission. Will you join us on this bridge? on this journey. And then finally, I would say the lost need a bridge. The lost need a bridge. Again, I'm a pastor. This is personal to me. It's perhaps the easiest one of the four for us to understand if we're believers. We know that the Bible declares that all of us have fallen short, the glory of God. Paul says in Romans chapter three, that we've all sinned. We've all fallen short of the glorious standard of God. We also understand that Scripture teaches us, and this is really so hard for us, that the lost have been blinded to God's Word. They don't understand it. Uh, notice what Paul says here to the Corinthians in chapter 4. Look at verse 3 and 4. This is a great verse for all of us as Christians to, to realize. He says, If the good news we preach is hidden behind a veil, it is hidden only from people who are perishing. Now, now catch this, Satan, who's the God of the world, he is a powerful foe. He has blinded the minds of those who don't believe. They're unable to see the glorious light, the good news. They don't understand this message about the glory of Christ, who is the exact likeness of God. Lost people, they don't get it. That's the reason when you have the courage and you talk to your lost relative or your family member or your uncle or that coworker or that friend, and you share with them what you know. And they look at like, like, are you stupid? Are you that gullible that you would believe in this fairy tale system of a God up in heaven that's going to take care of you? And you get frustrated with it. But hey, you got to understand they're blind. They can't see what we've been able to see by the Holy Spirit. Our eyes have been opened. Their eyes are shut. So will you be a bridge to the lost? Would you become a bridge? You got to keep talking. Keep loving. you got to understand the chasm is real. Eternity hangs in the balance for them. And I would just say, be like Jesus. Because when we were lost, who built and became a bridge for us? Jesus Christ, right? And Jesus spanned a chasm that none of us could span. And he became the bridge by dying on the cross so that we could trust in what he did for us on the cross and be forgiven of our sin and find a family for eternity in Jesus. Jesus is the ultimate bridge builder. I hope at Highlands we'll become a bridge, maybe to foster care, maybe to these kids. Maybe you'd become a bridge to a hurting Christian. Maybe you'd wade into this racial divide, and you would say, you know what? I'm going to become a bridge. You say, how do I do that, Alan? Well, do you know anybody in your world that's a different color than you are? Anybody? I would say that's the first step because we often think we know, and we understand it, but you can't really know until you walk in somebody else's shoes, until you hear their story, 
And then all of a sudden, the light comes on in your mind. Would you build a bridge to the lost? Because that's an eternal bridge that God wants us to build. Let's become a bridge today. Would you pray with me? Lord, what an awesome privilege and opportunity that you have given us to become a bridge. And we look at how you became a bridge for us that we're able to understand and enjoy what Christian abundant living is all about. Thank you for saving us. We were so unworthy. We deserved hell. And yet you left the splendor of heaven and you came to a cruel cross. And on that cross, you became a bridge for all, every human being. And today you're listening and you've never taken Jesus up and spanned that chasm that he spanned for you and trusted him as your Savior and Lord. And my goodness, what are you waiting on? Today's the day of salvation. Invite Jesus Christ into your life and just say right now, Jesus, I'm a sinner. I've made mistakes. Forgive me. Cleanse me. Save me, Jesus. Right now, save me. I surrender my life to you. And hey, if you prayed that prayer with me and you mean that from the depths of your heart, then I would just say, click that little button, raise your hand today and be proud that Jesus Christ has saved you. Your eyes are open. You can finally see his love for you. Let us know. Text the word Jesus to that number on your screen. We want to celebrate with you. For those of us who know Jesus, could we build a bridge to a foster child or to a foster family? Could we build a bridge in this racial chaos that we're seeing? We might step across and build a bridge to somebody who looks differently than us. Do we even have friendships like that? Man, heaven is going to be a place filled of diversity. I would say let's start making heaven here. Would you build a bridge to Christians that are hurting? All of us have somebody, hopefully, that's lost. We know if today they died, I hope that doesn't happen. They would not go to heaven. God's given us this opportunity to share the hope of the gospel of Jesus. Thank you, Father, for helping Highlands become a church of diversity. Lord, that we're a church for all people because your gospel is for all people. Thank you for our international partners, our folks in Pakistan. Lord, the people of the Middle East that we desperately love and share the gospel with. We're thankful for our partners in the Ivory Coast and in Tanzania. Thank you for Pastor Tony down in South Africa and all the network of pastors and church leaders that he has reaching thousands and thousands of people around the world with the hope of the gospel. Help us to continue always to become the bridge for your kingdom. In your name we pray. Amen.